For almost 23 years, a slow and ever increasing change has been coming to many people's lives living within the United Kingdom, the equalisation of a pension age. In 1995, a bill was passed to match the age at which both men and women can receive their pensions to be equal, that of 65 years old. This would see an increase in five years for women expecting their pensions, who could previously receive it at 60. Many saw this as a step forward, a push to a more fair and equal system for all it provided for. But for almost 3.6 million women around the country, this was not the case. Within this documentary, I will be speaking to some of the many women who have been affected by the change in the pension ages, getting to grips with how it has changed their lives and what steps they would have taken differently. I will also be speaking to the groups dedicated to providing justice to the millions of women affected by these changes, by campaigning for the repayment of the money they have lost. Due to the acceleration of the original 1995 plans, as well as lack of information given, many women were simply unaware that they would not be receiving their pensions at 60 years old. One of these women is Juliet Foster, a 64-year-old primary school teacher who has now had to continue working past her originally planned retirement date. Well, it's affected me a lot, really, because I plan to retire at 60 and to be able to access my state pension. It's affected, sort of, I would have worked full-time for longer if I'd known that this was the case. And also, I don't think I'd be working now. I mean, I've, I've reduced my hours now, so I'm working part-time because I'm accessing some of my teacher's pension. But I do need to keep on working, probably till I'm 66. So it's made a big difference to my life. Well, I think, I, I think the main issue here is a forewarning, really. And I think that um, in some ways, it does feel like equality for the re retirement age to be the same. But I think sort of forewarning and the fact that, you know, women have, and I'm certainly one of these women who've stopped to have children and then, you know, had time out when I never thought about putting more money into my pension, you know, those sorts of things. So I think that's where the main difference is between the men and the women, really, is that, you know, for, for a man, to, it's much, much easier to sort of get 30 plus years full time service. For a woman, that's much, much harder. A key point of Juliet's that has resonated around the internet is that of the lack of warning given to the women by the government about the changes in 2018. Many people have argued that because of the rushed implementation of the changes, women have been left completely off guard and unprepared for a longer working life, meaning many now had to scramble to provide for this. A crucial point of this is if given more warning of dates and facts of the changes and to the required age, people could have prepared for this inevitability much sooner, and probably smoother. Julia spoke on the ways in which young people should now be considering this also, to not be caught out like many women now have been. For a lot of young people, and my son's in this situation, is that uh, a lot of young people don't actually start having their full earning potential until later because they do a lot more travelling, and so I think a lot of young people are starting to sort of realise their uh, working potential in the 30s rather than in the 20s. That would certainly be the case for my own children. So I do worry a lot for them. Yes, I would really, although pers personal pensions are not reliable because they, they chop and change a lot. I know my personal pension, I did have a personal pension and it didn't come to anything like the fruition that we thought it would. Julia's comments had hit home with me personally, making me ask the question, what do young people actually know about pensions? I asked a selection of students around Leicester to find out their thoughts. Do you know anything about your state pension? Um, no, I've never really heard of it. I just thought it was something you got when you're older. Uh, to be honest, no, I have no idea about anything like that. Um, absolutely not. Not as much as I'd like to. I know absolutely nothing about state pensions, Ethan. Uh, not very much. We haven't really been told anything about them at all. I actually have no clue, no, sorry. No, I don't know anything about it, to be honest. Unsurprisingly, every student I asked knew almost little to no information about their state pension, saying that it's simply something they didn't have to think about right now. This lack of know-how has been debated for quite a while now, with many people arguing that information about pension should be taught in schools and universities to better prepare young people for their working lives and what comes afterwards. This reflects quite well with the lack of government warning to the women affected by these changing changes, as many had no idea it was happening other than a single letter. Another one of the women affected by these changes is 64-year-old Cheryl Butcher, who retired from the NHS at 55 years old. Before the changes to the pension age had been implemented, 
Sho was lucky enough to retire early, with relative financial security to fund her and her husband. After working for many years, a job she told me was quite hands-on and active, but change felt was quite a relief to her. Uh, so it didn't affect me that much. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to leave work because I was getting to the point where work was, it was hard work. Um, I was, I was, I worked in the hospital as a technician um, in cardiology. I was on my feet all day, walking miles, depending what job I was doing, walking miles around the wards. And I, I was just getting too, too tired for it. Um, if I got to work until I was 66 doing that, well, I couldn't do it. While able to retire early from a job, from other financial means, when the revised pension age was enacted in 2018, Cheryl was no longer able to obtain her money for an additional three years after complaints had been made by people and groups to the government about the injustice that many women have now been facing for set up a money reclaiming process that people could go through to try and reobtain their previously lost pensions. I know at one time they said on, on one of the websites, on the Waspy website, they were saying put in a claim to um, Department of Pensions, write to them and say how it's affected you. And there's, there's like, is it three stages or four stages to go through? And they say, you know, you'll probably come to, you know, the second or the third and think, oh, I can't do any more of this. The prolonged and laborious process of trying to submit a claim to the Department of Pensions has been a complaint for many of the women affected by the changes. Many have thought that its numerous stages and complicated inputs are designed to do exactly as Cheryl said, to make people give up on the process. A key issue that has been brought up is the act of having to actually claim for the money back in the first place. Yeah, well, that's it. It's not money that we are claiming that's just benefits. It's money that we paid into the system. I've worked since I was 16, and I think a lot of women are the same. We've worked, we've paid our taxes, and we paid uh, all in good faith, thinking that this money that we're paying into uh, national insurance will be able to claim back in a pension. And it's not happening. But it's all, to, like you say, it's all to do with saving money. Alongside the push for sex equality between men and women that the new pension ages would provide, a five-year increase in the achievement age for women also meant that the government would save an estimated £30 billion in unclaimed pensions. By prolonging the time people have to work before getting money from the state, more people are now likely to die before obtaining their pensions, saving the government money in the long term. A grim thought, I know. But this mentality was in the mind from the start of the process, being a key point brought up while still being discussed in Parliament back in 1995. This doesn't just extend to the pensions themselves, though. And it's not only just the pension that's, that gets affected, it's like bus passes. You're not allowed a bus pass, until, well, in Sheffield, you're not allowed a bus pass until you get your state pension. So that's another six years paying on the buses. While small in comparison, these knock-on effects can have large repercussions to people who rely on the state providing free transport links, as they may not be able to afford other means to get around. With the number of women being affected by these changes being as high as they are, in the millions, many have asked, what can be done to fight this system? Well, a number of groups have formed to campaign and stand against the changes, with a prominent leader being WASPy. Well, WASPI stands for Women Against State Pension Inequality, and we're campaigning to get some form of compensation for women who were born in the 1950s, who are expected to get their state pension at 60, and have had as much as six years added on to that time, so to 66, for instance, um, without enough time or notice from the government to prepare for, for such a big change to their financial expectations in retirement. That was Sheila Simmons, the WASPI coordinator for Portsmouth, Southampton, Winchester, South Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, an area that has around 116,000 women that would have been affected by the changes, with many still not being able to be contacted by the WASPI group, which again shows one of the underlying issues with the changes, a complete lack of notice given to the people, a point Sheila agreed with. Yes, because when, when this um, was first passed through Parliament in 1995, they didn't actually start writing to anybody until 14 years later. Like 2009, I think, was the first time they sent out any letters because at that point, I think they must have realised that people didn't know this was coming. Um, and the, the government are saying that the actual passing of the Act was noticed in itself, but 
if um, if you're changing a policy that's been fixed and accepted for decades, then um, we feel that they need to do more than that. They can't just leave you to find out for yourself. They should actually tell you. For, for instance, one of the women in our group went to a hospital appointment last week, and she's 62 or 63, and one of the staff there, one of the nurses said, oh, you'll, you'll be getting your pension now, you're a pensioner. And that was someone who works in the NHS who obviously didn't know. So those sorts of anecdotes suggest to us that there, that there are still people that don't know out there. And, um, you know, I have met some myself who are actually quite shocked when you say to them, well, you do know you're not going to be getting your pension at 60. The main ways in which WASPI have been campaigning for justice to those affected is through protests within towns and cities around the country as well as leafleting campaigns. The raising awareness has now created the phrase of WASPI women, those women affected by the changes to the pension age. Much of this is in the hopes of raising awareness of the issue, not only to those affected by it, but also to Parliament itself. Sheila explained to me that the main way in which change is going to come is by contacting MPs and persuading them to bring the issue up to the House, a task that has recently gotten much more complicated. Um, I think it's, it's difficult. Um, in the last Parliament, um, when the Conservatives didn't have such a big majority, um, there may have been more support for us. There were lots of lots of debates, um, opposition day debates and things of that nature, and questions being asked in the House. And um, But of course, since the election, the Conservatives have now got um, an 80-seat majority. And there are lots of, lots of new MPs in Parliament who who may not know about our issue or our campaign. So um, part of our strategy now is to contact all of those and try and get them on board with our campaign. Much of the hard work that the people at WASPI have done to get a revised act through Parliament has been overshadowed by the effects of Brexit, that has controlled the House for almost five years now, meaning they have had to try twice as hard to get their points across. Some women have felt as though they have been abandoned by the government, who have forgotten or simply don't care about their issues. WASPI are aiming to help the 3.6 million women affected by this change and help them to understand that they are not alone in their struggle, as well as making sure the government know they are not going away. Before um, the current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, before he was, he was leader of the Conservative Party, um, during the actual leadership campaign, he did promise that he would, he would revisit our issue and look at it again. So um, he seems to have forgotten that he did that, but we haven't forgotten and we'll be reminding him that that's what he promised that he would do. If you are one of the WASPI women who would like to get help from them, or just someone who is passionate to get involved, there's the WASPI campaign website, uh, which is waspi.co.uk. Um, you can also find the main WASPI page on Facebook, and they're also on Twitter. So those are the ways that you can get in touch with the main campaign. With the massive information and statistics that I have learned about the Pension Act and WASPI itself, I spoke to Karen Lawson, a senior law lecturer at De Montfort University who specialises in employment law. She explained to me the intriguing ways in which the 1995 Equalisation Act came to be. This essentially started all the way back in 1990 when a man called Mr James went to a swimming pool. <laughs> Um, what happened is that Mr and Mrs James were both 61 and they went to their local swimming pool, which was run by Eastleigh Borough Council. This local swimming pool had their admission prices based on the state pension age, which at the time was 60 for women, 65 for men. Because of this, Mrs, J uh, Mrs James got in for free, but Mr James had to pay 75 pence to enter. He then brought a claim against the council arguing that this was sex discrimination. Karen explained that this single act had birthed the beginnings of what would become a change that would affect people all over the country for years to come. The spiral effect within Parliament raised the question of if its then pension law were discriminatory. They, the House of Lords held that the state pension age itself is discriminatory on the grounds of sex, and that's why the council basing their funding on this, uh, sorry, so their um, admission prices on this, was itself discriminatory. So that's when it all started. Um, and it was in 1995 that the government first indicated that it was now going to equalise the pension ages uh, between men and women. It's still unclear to what the outcome will be for the women such as Juliet and Cheryl, as well as the millions affected elsewhere. Groups such as Washby have promised to continue to fight for them, to gain back the money they have lost and help end the injustice that has been created. 
Raising awareness and understanding has been over one of our main goals since the beginning. The future is yet to tell what will happen for the 3.6 million affected by this crucial change to the law. But what is clear is that now, the word is out.